Hello and welcome to Oxplore, the home of big questions. Today we're going to be talking to Patricia Clavin, who is a specialist in international history at the University of Oxford, and she is going to be helping us to understand more about the financial impact of war. And this discussion is a part of our big question, can war be a good thing? So let's kick off there. So Patricia, can war be a good thing as far as money goes? Can war help a country's economy? Yes, it absolutely can, but it helps a lot if you're a country that's not in the middle of the fighting. So you want to be a country that's supplying other countries who are fighting, but not in the middle of a conflict. Great, okay, well let's dive in with a specific example then. Tell us about uh, a country who was involved in a war, maybe not directly, where it was actually good for their economy. So the best example in the 20th century is probably the Second World War and the United States. Uh, The United States doesn't enter the war until December 1941, but the war already starts in Europe in September 1939, so it's almost two years later. And during those two years, the United States is uh, busy supplying the British Empire and its efforts to defeat Nazi Germany. The United States produces more weapons than all of the Axis powers combined already by 1943. And by the end of the Second World War, it it has so much productive capacity in its economy. That means it's able to produce more than anybody else. Uh, and if we compare that to Britain, it's producing more than four times the British economy wow. can produce by 1945, three times more than the Soviet Union could produce. So it has enormous... Um, it's gained enormous power through the economic effects of the Second World War. Okay, but so that's thinking about the big level for the whole country. What about for actual, just ordinary Americans? How was that affecting them financially? Well, it has a lot of benefits for American citizens who are staying in the United States. The, I mean, I've been talking about it in terms of the United States producing weapons to fight the war and ships that they use to sail the seas. But it's also that the kind of um, changes to the American economy means that they are able to produce consumer goods more cheaply and more effectively than ever before. So it also means that you can buy cars, fridges, the American-style big fridges, toasters, Hoovers. They become cheaper because of the way that American factories have changed as a result of of war production but it's also that the first world war the second world war generates lots of employment opportunities in the 1930s there'd been a lot of unemployment in the united states and the second world war means that um all of that's sucked up that actually there's almost full employment nearly everybody in the united states mm. that wants a job has a job by 1945 so it means that american living standards increase significantly as a result of the second world war Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it good for any other countries, any other people, or just the Americans? Well, for the Americans, actually, because they're now producing so much stuff, actually need to care about the rest of the world in the way that they Mm -hmm. haven't before. So the Americans aren't just producing goods for themselves. After 1945, it becomes very important for them to sustain this continued economic growth, to export those goods to Europe. And it's also that the Second World War doesn't lead the world into peace. It leads into another war, the Cold War, which is a a clash between the capitalist West and the communist East. And and so the the kind of economic benefits of the Second World War also shape the nature of that conflict. Okay, well, the Cold War, obviously a very different type of war from the Second World War, but did it have similar impacts? Did it also help countries' economies? Yes, I mean, the Cold War is, is, is different to the Second World War because of the name you know, itself, which suggests that there isn't any fighting, that the war mm. is cold. But that, it gets that name because there's no fighting in Europe. But actually, the Cold War is pretty hot around the rest of the world. Um, there's lots of fighting in Africa and in Asia. And the very first hot war in the Cold War comes in Korea in 1950. And that has enormous economic benefits, both for West Germany, but especially for Japan. The Americans um, occupy Japan after the Second World War. And Japan is um, a broken country, really, in the wake of the, you know, them dropping the atomic bomb and Japan's empire in Asia has collapsed. And the Americans really aren't quite sure at that point how they want to treat Japan. And one of the big problems that they have is Japan has these very large corporations, which the Americans aren't sure whether they should keep or break up because they're anxious about this productive capacity. When war breaks out in Korea, 
the Americans decide they need Japan to be back in the world economy. And so this has a great economic benefit for Japan. And companies like Toshiba, which you know is famous now, is put back on its feet by the Americans. The Americans ask Toshiba to make Jeeps and, and a variety of other equipment that they use to fight the Koreans. But it also enables Toshiba to buy state-of-the-art equipment in from uh, the United States. So it sort of hugely develops its productive strength and that's what enables a Japanese economy to grow enormously in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. So it's one of the world leaders at the end of that period. And actually, the Korean War is also really helpful for West Germany because it's in a similar state. It's also occupied by the French, the British and the United States, who also are not really sure what they want to do about its productive capacity. But the Korean War means they have to get West Germany moving again, too. I mean, in the framework of the Cold War. And one of the really sort of shocking things about the an economic benefit of the Second World War um, comes in the way that it, it changes and reshapes the German car industry. In the 1920s and 30s, Germany, like lots of other countries, has a kind of um, embryonic a, a car, car industry, a car industry at the beginning of its life. But the Germans build the cars from the ground up. By that I mean that five people would get together and build a car, sort of almost like in a garage, which meant these cars were beautiful, beautifully handcrafted, but extremely expensive and with lots of technical problems. But the Second World War means that Nazi Germany, like the United States, really modernises the way it produces goods um, through mass production. And it's that combination of mass production and these very specialised skills that enables the German car industry to become a world leader in the 1950s and 60s. We don't really like to think of anything good coming out of Nazi Germany, but um, that's an example of something that does. OK, so we've heard a lot about the positive effects that war can have on a country's economy, but let's talk about some of the bad now. Give us some examples of when war has really hurt a country financially. Well, it really hurt Britain. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, Britain was the world's leading financial power. But fighting the First World War meant that Britain used so much of its money up that it had to borrow money from the United States. So after the end of the First World War, and by 1918, Britain is now a debtor country. It owed money to the United States, and it was the Americans that were now the leading financial power in the world. And that had all sorts of consequences for the world financial system, but also for its political relations. Uh, and that's reinforced then by the Second World War, because the Second World War really breaks the back of the British Empire. Well, they weren't the only ones actually to have had an empire damaged by war. Um... No, most of the empires in the First World War don't survive it. So mm. actually the British and the French who are on the winning side are lucky to get out with, with that kind of damage. So if we, if we turn to Central and Eastern Europe, the German Empire doesn't survive the First World War. The Russian Empire doesn't survive the First World War. The Ottoman Empire doesn't survive the First World War. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is right in the middle of the heart of Europe, doesn't survive the First World War. And for those people, more than possibly any other group in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, the economic damage is enormous. But so what did that actually mean then for people in 1918 in Austria? Um, well, you, you would have felt a, a number of consequences. Um, what it meant for people in 1918 was that they were hungry, that their money wasn't worth very much, that they were unemployed, uh, and they felt very frightened and anxious about their neighbours turning on them. Um, people who lived in the Austro-Hungarian Empire before 1918 were used to trading and moving food and goods across their country borders very easily. There weren't any borders really between them. By 1918, because the empire no longer exists, what you have are lots of separate countries. And it means for Austrians that they no longer have access to the people who used to supply their food. Austria used to make lots of stuff and they would trade it and in return import most of their food requirements. So they would buy in grain from Hungary. After 1918, they're not able to do that anymore. So it means that Austrians are hungrier than any other Europeans in the wake of the First World War. It also means that because people don't have faith in Austria really 
and its economy working or its state being viable, I, in other words, people don't trust their government, you also have inflation in the economy. And that means that your money buys less and less and less. You see these famous pictures of people wheeling wheelbarrows, through, uh, wheelbarrows full of money through the streets of Germany. Well, the same thing is happening in Austria. It also means because of that, there's almost no employment opportunity. So in contrast, when we think about the Americans um, getting wealthier during the course of war, Austrians get poorer and poorer, both in the First World War and immediately afterwards. And that ultimately has consequences for its politics. People lose confidence in the politicians who are kind of in the centre ground in Austria and instead either vote for communists, mostly in, in the city of Vienna. Uh, it's known as Red Vienna because almost every single politician is either a, you know the extreme left or a communist. Uh, and in the countryside in Vienna, um, people vote for nationalists and ultimately fascist parties. And so by the mid to late 1930s, really, Austrians no longer have any confidence in their country at all because they're just not able to recover from the impact of the First World War. So when they're invited by Adolf Hitler, who's an Austrian himself, who goes to Germany in the wake of the First World War and stays there and to, invites Austria to join the Third Reich, that's exactly what Austrians do. And actually, that's a really interesting example of a, a kind of cycle of there's an initial war, the First World War, which leads to a really bad economy in Austria, which in turn leads them to into a situation which kind of brings on the Second World War, which in turn brings on a good economy for countries like America. Um, so a really interesting cycle. Um, so ultimately, that, that does kind of seem to demonstrate to us that war can be a good thing as far as the economy goes it isn't always it can be negative but it certainly is possible for it to be a good thing so i mean has that kind of answered our big question can war be a good thing i mean clearly as far as money goes yes it can yes well you're right on in one way beth but Econ economics, thinking about economic consequences of war, means you have to think about the present in relation to the future. That's what economics is always about. So uh, you think about building coal-fired power stations, that produces cheap electricity, so that gives you a benefit now. But in the longer run, it also means that you have serious economic consequences for the environment. And the economic costs of war are rather like that. They're trade-offs. And the question is what you're prepared to trade with. It's not just about thinking about goods and, and food and money. It's also that you're trading with people's lives. So if you think back to those Americans that were enjoying a better standard of living and cheaper food and higher levels of employment in the Second World War, at the same time as that they had those benefits, they were also suffering in that their, their husbands, their fathers, their brothers were away fighting in the Second World War. And then after that, in wars in Korea and the continuation of the Cold War that lasted another 40 years. So at the end of the day, there are always benefits and there are always costs. You have to decide what's important to you. Absolutely. Ultimately, these are really tough questions. There are no easy answers, but there are certainly plenty of things for us to be thinking about. So thank you so much for giving us all of that food for thought today, Patricia. It's been great to talk with you. Thanks, Beth. I've enjoyed it. Um, and for those of you listening in, thanks for exploring this question with us. We really hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next time.